But in Texas, will Sierra Jacobs choose the man she loves or the only man who has ever shown her kindness? Growing up in the suburbs of Houston, Sierra Jacobs' childhood is a constant struggle. Her father wasn't in the picture. Her mother uh, was incarcerated. And so her parents really weren't ever there for her. The one person that always has her back is her brother, Carino. Carino was two years younger than her, and he was really all she ever had. So she probably was very protective over him. And while their mother is behind bars, their maternal grandma, Patty, takes them in. Sierra and Carino lived with their grandmother for the majority of their teenage years, and she did what she could. But despite having their grandmother as their new guardian, Sierra and Carino are mostly left to fend for themselves. Sierra had to step up and become a maternal figure to her little brother, and to have that kind of responsibility at such a young age really can affect one's maturity for years to come. But in her early teen years, things start to look up for Sierra when her grandmother starts seeing a kind man named Jimmy Ray Boyd. Jimmy was a 62-year-old male who lived in that particular area the majority of his life. Jimmy stepped in as her step-grandfather, and so they all moved into his home, and they became this big, happy family. And for the first time, Sierra and Greeno had security in their life. Over the next several years, Sierra thrives in school, but she can't quite shake the feeling of being different. Sierra was biracial. Her father was African-American. Her mother was Caucasian. I think when you're a biracial child, you never really know which group to identify with. And then I think it was very difficult for Sierra to really figure out where she fit in. That is until she reaches the age of 16 and meets Juan Lopez around the neighborhood. Juan is a Mexican-American, and I think it was difficult for him in schools as well, really figuring out where to fit in. And so for the first time, she bonds with someone who knows what it's like to be an outsider. Their connection is undeniable. The teenagers start to date, and things move fast. Within a few weeks, they take the relationship to the next level. They have this very interesting courtship, typical teen love. And it's so easy for her to fall for him just because she hasn't had this type of affection. But soon their whirlwind romance has an unexpected surprise. A surprise that leads to deadly consequences. She was wrapped into this whirlwind of this wicked person. Sierra was blinded by her love for him and they had no regard for human life. In Houston, Texas, 16-year-old Sierra Jacobs has fallen head over heels for a towering young man named Juan Lopez. The love-struck teenagers spend every second they can by each other's side. Their romance is filled with intimacy. But they manage to hide their love affair from Sierra's grandma and her partner, Jimmy Boyd. She sneaks him into Jimmy's house pretty much every night. They're teenagers, they're in love. But the starry-eyed lovers aren't all that careful. And pretty soon, they are in for a surprise. A few months into dating, they get pregnant. As we see with youngsters, a lot of times, they don't practice safer sex. So they ended up having an unplanned pregnancy. And the fact of the matter is, they just weren't ready. Sierra's grandma, Patty, and step-grandfather, Jimmy, are not happy, but they do their best to support her. And the future teen mom knows she'll face many difficulties raising a child and finishing school. Her only comfort is that she will have Juan by her side. He was definitely there physically to support her every step of the way for her pregnancy. When the baby finally arrives, Juan comes over daily to help out. And the young couple steps up to work as a team. She was excited and happy, you know, she thinks she's with the love of her life, and now they have a child, which kind of solidified their relationship. But just as their relationship gets stronger, the bond between the older couple in the house disintegrates. 
The grandmother and Jimmy were separated. She left the residence and she got her own place. So she didn't only leave Jimmy, she left Sierra, she left Carino, and she left this life that she had. And, you know, this was devastating for Sierra. But Sierra is not about to leave the one place she truly feels comfortable, Jimmy's home. And her step-grandpa is more than happy to have them around. It gave Jimmy an opportunity to have a greater purpose. Now he has to take care of these two children and a grandchild. You know, he kind of adopted these kids. He wants the best for them. But when he finds out that Sierra is pregnant yet again, he pulls her aside and reveals his true feelings about Juan. So he has a conversation with Sierra, and he mentioned to her that, you know, I don't think Juan is good for you. I don't think this is the guy that you want to spend the rest of your life with. He has no respect. I've seen his type. Sierra makes it clear she loves Juan, and she's going to stand by her man, no matter what. It's evident to Jimmy he's stuck with Juan, so he lays down some ground rules. Juan is not to spend the night. Juan basically moved into Jimmy's home and he gave Sierra undivided attention all the time. And Sierra needed that. Jimmy had no problems with Juan coming around for the baby and Sierra, but he was not gonna enable Juan to freeload off of him. But the amorous young couple doesn't exactly follow the house rules. Sierra wanted Juan at the house regardless of how Jimmy felt. There were times that Juan would stay the night you know, two or three nights out of the week. And soon, the young couple have another little bundle of joy to take care of. Now that he has two kids with Sierra, Juan is around even more, and things between he and Jimmy often get heated. It was very hostile because Jimmy just wanted to be at his house, but Juan, whenever he came, uh, tried to rule his house. There were arguments uh, constantly between Jimmy and Juan, when cooler heads prevail, Jimmy decides it's time to talk to Juan, man to man. Juan essentially wanted to live there rent free. Then Jimmy said, you know, you're going to have to contribute to the household. You're going to have to really step it up. Juan didn't have a job, so financially he couldn't contribute to paying the bills or any of the groceries. As the months go by, the now crowded house is making a serious dent in Jimmy's bank account. And when he learns that Sierra is pregnant yet again with their third child, the gracious grandpa hits his breaking point. And he finally said, Juan, you have to go. And at that point, Juan said, no way. I'm not going anywhere. You leave. Juan wasn't going to let some old man push him around and intimidate him. And so threats were made. Sierra sits silently as the two most important men in her life butt heads. And as things escalate, Jimmy sees a side of the younger man that he's never seen before. And I think he really, for the first time, was afraid of Juan. And Jimmy actually had to leave his own home. And he went to stay with a friend so that he could figure things out. For the next several days, the young couple enjoys free reign of the house with their kids while Jimmy must come to terms with his dire cash flow problems. He was in jeopardy of losing his home. So Jimmy had to reach out to his sister for help because this home had been in their family for years. Jimmy explains the situation he's in and how it's drained him emotionally and financially. I can't let them go out on the street. I mean, I, I'm worried about them. She listens intently and tells her brother that she's willing to bail him out. She'll take over the payments on the house. Jimmy was going to turn over the deed to his sister. But there's one condition. He's the only one she wants living there. She said, I'll help you, but you have to get rid of all of those people in your home. This was a very difficult situation for Jimmy because he really didn't want to have to kick Sierra out of the house, but he knew there was time to cut ties after having to deal with Juan being a freeloader in his home for the past three years. Jimmy agrees, and they make a plan to meet in the next few weeks to fill out the paperwork. 
A few days later, Jimmy finally returns home. He sits with Juan, Sierra, and Carino to let them know that he's out of money, and soon the house will no longer be his. They will have to leave. They all sit in stunned silence. But as soon as he leaves the room, their true feelings show. Juan gets very upset, and he's talking to Sierra and her younger brother, Carino, and he's saying, you know, what are we going to do? We can't get put out. We don't have anywhere else to go. What are we going to do? Backed into a corner, the teenagers lash out. And what happens next will shake this family to the core. This was the most horrific, disgusting thing she had ever seen. But Sierra was blinded by him the entire time. And now they've truly lost it all. In Houston, pregnant with her third child, teenager Sierra Jacobs, her boyfriend Juan Lopez, and her younger brother Carino are about to lose their rent-free living situation. Sierra's step-grandfather Jimmy has been letting them crash, but after falling on hard times, he has no choice but to kick them out. They were all very, very upset that he would even come up with the idea of them moving out. But Juan has no plans to pack his stuff. The solution for Juan was to get rid of Jimmy, and he determined the best way to get rid of Jimmy was to kill him. By his logic, if Jimmy is dead, he won't be able to sign over the deed to his sister, and the house will be theirs. Juan's saying all of these things, but she never really imagines that this is actually going to happen. Worried about her two children and the one on the way, the young mother sees no other options. She reluctantly agrees. And even Sierra's younger brother, Carino, is on board. The only way that I think that Sierra could have gone along with this crazy plan was Juan being so manipulative and persuasive, but also the fact that she really loved Juan. Over the next several days, tensions are at an all-time high in the makeshift family. And what's bubbling below comes to the surface one spring morning when Jimmy announces he's heading over to see his sister. They came to the realization that since Jimmy was going to sign the papers, that it was now or never. Juan then signaled to Sierra to take the children and to leave the home. Juan meets him at the door, and he blocks him. Jimmy tells him, hey, I need to leave the house. Juan says, no, you're not going anywhere. With Carino in his room and the children out of the house, the much younger man makes his move. Juan pushes Jimmy multiple times. Then he strikes Jimmy, which knocks him unconscious. Juan grabs a hammer. He starts to hit Jimmy over the head. I mean, this guy just had no mercy. He continued to beat him and beat him and beat him senseless. But Juan is not finished. After he struck Jimmy multiple times, Juan slit his throat. After he kills him, he has young Carino help him wrap this body in a tarp. Carino! Not wanting to get caught with a body in broad daylight, he and Carino stash it so they can dispose of it later. And they hid the body under an abandoned house on the property. Juan sends word to Sierra that the deed is done and she returns. She was devastated. The step-granddad was someone that she cared for and who had cared for her. Now she had to live with her decision to allow this to happen for the rest of her life. They all try their best to pretend like everything is normal. But later that day, there's an unexpected visitor. There was a knock at the door. This knock was from Jimmy's sister. She had come by to see him because today was the day that they were supposed to transfer over the deed into her name. Where's Jimmy? Everyone's like, we don't know. We haven't seen Jimmy. And she's like, that's funny. His car is still out front. Where's my brother? Jimmy's sister refuses to back down. So Juan invites the insistent woman to come inside and look around. 
When she enters her family home, she immediately senses that she has stepped into the lion's den. She can feel it. She knows something's wrong. Why would his car be here? Why wouldn't he show up? And what have they done to my brother? Juan was malicious, and the fact that he did all of these things is just despicable. Just hours after killing Jimmy Boyd, Houston area teenagers Sierra Jacobs, her boyfriend Juan Lopez, and her brother Carino are confronted by their victim's sister. She looks around the house, but finds no trace of her brother or any foul play. She searches it, she looks around, but they've done a wonderful job of cleaning up everything. Still, she's convinced something terrible happened. I have no doubt the sister was immediately suspicious that something uh, was wrong. Getting an odd feeling that she might become their next victim, the sister makes a hasty exit. They all breathe a sigh of relief. And as the sun goes down, Juan and Carino get busy with their plan to dispose of Jimmy's dead body. They take the body, they put it into Jimmy's car, and they drive miles away, and they put the body in the bayou. It was bad enough that Jimmy was murdered by Juan, but then to just take his body and dump it in the bayou uh, with such careless disregard, just vicious. With the body now taken care of, they believe they're home free. I think they felt like Jimmy's existence wasn't very important to anyone, and him being missing wouldn't get anyone's attention, so they could go on and uh, live on his property and in his house without anyone being suspicious. But little do they know, Jimmy's sister went right to the authorities. She immediately notified the police that her brother was missing and that she suspects that there had been some foul play. I spoke with Jimmy's sister, and based on what she told me, I felt it was pretty solid evidence indicating the suspects were Juan, Carino, and Sierra. When investigators arrive at the house, they find the teenagers are surprisingly cooperative. Myself and my partner went to the residence, and after speaking with them briefly, Juan and Carino voluntarily agreed to come give statements. But Sierra stayed at the residence because she didn't have anyone to leave her children with. Initially, the young men stick to a similar story and deny knowing anything about Jimmy's disappearance. So Detective Jones tries another approach. We asked both to submit to polygraph exams, which they agreed to. And the polygraph exams showed deception on their part. So we interviewed them again. Caught in their lies, Carino and Juan come clean. They are both charged with murder. But Sierra's name never comes out of their mouths. So the detectives are still not sure if she's involved. That is, until later that evening, when they talk to her directly. She admitted that she was aware that Juan was going to murder Jimmy. She was present at the house prior to the murder. And then she packed up her children and left. What do you want me to do? I don't know what else to say. It's really astonishing how quickly the three of them uh, actually confessed to his murder. I think this speaks tremendously of the guilt that they felt. It was overwhelming for them. Juan Lopez, Carino Ratcliffe, and Sierra Jacobs are each charged with capital murder. While awaiting their pretrial hearings, Sierra decides to accept a plea deal with a lesser charge. Instead of capital murder, Sierra pled guilty to tampering with a human corpse. She is sentenced to just 10 years, but her boyfriend and her little brother aren't as fortunate. The judge called this one of the most horrendous murders he'd ever seen. And Juan ended up receiving a life sentence with no parole. And Carino received 40 years in the Texas Department of Corrections. Sierra was a young girl who was always looking for love. And she finally found it with Juan, and she was willing to do anything to maintain the bond that they created. And now she's truly lost it all. Her children are without a mother, without a father, and my heart just goes out to them. She had to choose between the man who cared for her or Juan, the man who loved her, and she made the wrong decision.
In the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia, Abby Kemp has always had a desire to break free from her slow-paced, privileged upbringing. Abby had a rebellious spirit. She bucked authority. But when she meets a noted area thief, Abby gets drawn into a dangerous underworld of heists and begins a multi-state crime spree. You just don't see that type of crime happen in this area. He hit the jackpot when he met Abby because he knew that she would do anything to make him happy. And later in Houston, biracial teenager Sierra Jacobs has always felt like an outsider. But all that changes when she meets Juan Lopez and falls for him hook, line, and sinker. She found comfort in the fact that they were both different and they were head over heels in love for each other. But when a family member threatens to come between the young lovers, Juan makes a hasty decision and convinces his girl that they have no other choice. She was in love with Juan, and she was willing to do whatever she had to to keep him in her life. The judge called this one of the most horrendous crimes that he'd ever seen. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man, Georgia Peach, Abigail Kemp, or Abby as her family calls her, hails from an affluent suburb of Atlanta. She's the beloved youngest daughter of a well-respected and high-powered professional couple. Abby grew up in Marietta, one of the wealthiest cities in America. The Kemps have always expected a lot from Abby and her older sister and provide them with everything necessary to achieve a successful life. Her upbringing was so classic and so well-groomed. She had every tool she could possibly imagine educationally, socioeconomically. While Abby's older sister works hard to live up to her parents' high standards, young Abby proves to be a handful from an early age. And when Abby becomes a teenager, things aren't much different. Abby started hanging out with a different group of people that got her into trouble. When someone is born with a silver spoon in their mouths, they can feel very entitled. Uh, and in Abby's case, she was looking for chaos. She was looking to shake things up. But her parents proved to be helpless against their daughter's charm. So she often avoids punishment for her bad behavior. I'm really sorry. Some would say she was a spoiled brat. Um, so she was always given everything she wanted. By the time Abby enters high school, she's even more determined to not follow the good girl path to success laid out for her. Throughout high school, Abby had a, a reputation of being outspoken with her teachers and, and administrators and her coaches. And by her senior year, the wealthy teen starts regularly sneaking off to downtown Atlanta to party with her new crowd of friends. Abby was beautiful, charming, and so she used her power to get into clubs. She started drinking underage and just partying and having fun. Despite her wild lifestyle, she manages to graduate from high school. Now free, she ditches her boring suburban life and heads straight back to the ATL for good. Abby left her parents' home, but unfortunately, she didn't have a plan for college or a job. Still living off her parents' money and all alone in the city, Abby continues her party girl ways. She was in a much bigger city, a lot more opportunity to get involved with the wrong people. Abby had this need to break away from her parents, to break away from this life of privilege. She had a thirst for danger. And also, she thought that if she got into trouble, her parents would bail her out, as they often did. Eventually, Abby lands a job as a waitress, and the teen beauty also does some modeling on the side. But even with her busy schedule, the teenager still manages to find plenty of time to get in trouble with the law. Abby was arrested for underage drinking. She was 19 years old, was caught without a proper ID, and then she was just kind of spiraled downhill from there. And over the next two years, she racks up charges of drug possession, several DUIs, and even lands an assault charge for getting into a fight with a fellow employee. But as always, her parents come to her rescue. Her parents continually bailed her out, and there just seemed to be, you know, no punishment. They were always getting her out of trouble, so they weren't necessarily helping her, they were enabling her. Then one night, 
while waiting tables. Trouble finds her. Tall, dark, and handsome, 35 year old Louis Lou Jones strikes up a conversation with the brunette beauty. Louis Jones was big and tall, intimidating to some people. They had immediate chemistry. Lou was really enamored with how young and beautiful Abby was and how much attention that Abby was giving him when they first met. He's tough, no nonsense, and a bona fide bad boy. I have a little note for you. So uh, I hope you guys had a great night. And after that first meeting, they begin dating and their affair develops rapidly and is filled with passion. They had a very fast and furious relationship and it grew very quickly. They spent a lot of time together. It was a genuine chemistry. Lou didn't hold back any information about his past life. He had a criminal history and he was wanted for bank robbery. The hustler brags that he never gets caught because he knows exactly what he's doing. Abby doesn't flinch. In fact, she's riveted. No way. That's so hot. How do you... I think that she saw some truth in him, a level of honesty that she was attracted to. Abby thought that he would bring some excitement into her life. But Lou isn't exactly the type of guy you bring home to mama. Abby knew that her parents would not approve of Lou or his criminal past, and he was kept a huge secret. None of her friends ever met Lou. And Abby's dirty little secret will soon push the rebellious rich girl to the point of being one of the most wanted women in America. Lewis made her who she was. He saw her as a pawn. It is astonishing what she did. Twenty-four-year-old Atlanta debutante Abby Kemp is hot and heavy with her stealthy beau, Lou Jones. But what she doesn't realize is that he sees her not just as a dime piece, but also a partner in crime. He saw someone he could train and be really good at robberies. I mean, attractive young female that could come to a room and just fit in. And Lou has the perfect plan to utilize Abby's unique skill set. He wants to move away from banks and start hitting jewelry stores. Lou thought it was genius to bring the beautiful, young, charming Abby into his jewelry heist schemes. He knew that Abby fit the part, and if she walked into a jewelry store, no one would be skeptical of her. But he'll need help turning the stolen goods into cash, so he calls in some past associates, Larry and Michael Gilmore. The Gilmore brothers were an integral part because they had the connections for when the jewelry was sold in Florida. Lou pitches the idea to his girl. Abby is intrigued, but not quite sure if she's up for something that could land her behind bars. Sounds like way more than I've ever done. I'm gonna introduce you to some guys. I'm gonna teach you everything you need to know. Initially, Abby did have a little conscience in the back of her mind, like, should I actually be doing this? This is actually illegal. Abby has fancied herself to be a bad girl, but now Lewis is asking her to be involved in these robberies. So she really had to think hard about this, because once she got involved, there'd be no turning back. Lou maps out exactly how they would go through with the plan and assures her that he'd never let anything happen to her. You're going to be with me there. I okay, babe, I got you. As he started to unveil his plan, Abby became interested, and she trusted him. Then I'll, I'll do it. Uh, you got, you yeah. gonna be there for me? Yeah, of course I'm gonna be there for you. Abby was really excited and thrilled about the opportunity that Lou was offering her to actually do a jewelry heist with her lover, someone that accepted her. Lou takes his girl to meet the Gilmore brothers, who work at a window tinting store in town. And to his delight, the introduction goes better than he could have ever imagined. See, we in the jewelry business. Right, right. We ain't jewelers. We moving these things. <laughs> right. There was a really fast camaraderie that occurred with Abby. They accepted her, and they loved her, and that really sealed the deal on her involvement. And in anticipation for her first heist, Abby receives intensive training. 
they needed to actually acculturate her into the jewelry heist process. You know, what were the operations? What were the ways of working? They use the tent shop that they have as a training facility where they teach her firearm manipulation, how to zip tie people, how to command the room, what kind of jewelry to, to grab, what to leave. So they just are constantly training her to be this super jewelry thief. With encouragement from Lou, she begins to master each element of her boot camp. I think she wanted to prove that she could do it, and she thought it was a good plan. It was an underworld that excited her in some way and, and made her involved and accepted. After a few weeks of Jewel Thief boot camp, Abby is ready. One April morning in Woodstock, Georgia, 30 miles outside of Atlanta, the team arrives at their first target. The Gilmore brothers act as the lookouts outside in the getaway vehicle. While inside, Lou will take the lead and Abby will shadow. She enters first and pretends to shop. She had the earpiece on, was told to walk around and look at jewelry items. And then when he came in, he pulled out the gun, demanded everyone get on the floor. And she lies down as she's being directed by Lou and she observes how the whole thing happens. While Lou ushers the employees to a back room and zip ties them, Abby remains on the ground until she gets a signal from Lou, just as they had planned. She's still on the floor in the front, but she's watching him as he comes out, as he's going through all the different jewelry. And then when he's done, they walk out together like they're a couple. Hi. Was that good? Hi. They hop in the getaway car and speed off towards Atlanta with a massive haul of stolen jewels. They actually got away with $800,000 in jewelry. They celebrate their success, and Abby has truly proven herself to be one of them. This first heist was a huge success, and especially for Abby. She was thrilled that she got to break the law and get away with it. She was going to do whatever it took to be part of the squad. The Gilmore brothers take the entire jewelry haul down to Miami and sell it on the black market. And once Abby and Lou get their portion of the cut, they immediately get a luxury condo in Atlanta's bedroom community of Smyrna. After they moved in together, they were sitting and enjoying all the new money that they received. Lou and Abby were living a life of luxury in their beautiful apartment. The two of them enjoy their growing love amidst their newfound fortune but the thieving couple is far from finished. And with her first heist behind her, Abby Kemp has a thirst for more. The crew's next target is 50 miles north of Atlanta in Dawsonville, Georgia. But now there's a new plan. Abby's going in solo. Abby gained confidence, and she felt that she could go into the jewelry store and do it by herself. This time, armed with shotguns, the men drop her off in front of the store and park nearby to keep lookout. Abby had gone through a lot of preparation for this next heist. And more than anything else, she didn't want to let down Lewis and the Gilmore brothers. Lou made sure Abby fit the part, and she arrived and just blended in. Once again, Abby browses the glass displays, appearing to be a normal customer while Lou instructs her through an earpiece. He lets her know that it's go time. She presents the firearm, takes them in the back room, zip ties them. With the employees restrained, Abby returns to the front of the store, where she nabs the most precious stones to bring back to her boys. She starts collecting jewelry, but all of a sudden has to stop. Despite all of her intense training, Abby has made a major rookie mistake. She forgot to lock the door, so another customer walked in. And later, in Houston, when outcast Sierra Jacobs finally finds acceptance in the arms of a handsome man, she must decide how far she's willing to go to protect their bond. You never expect the people that you care for would do anything as horrendous as this. This is about young people, their greed, and their disregard for human life. 50 miles north of Atlanta, Georgia, 24-year-old Abby Kemp is in the middle of her first solo jewel heist after receiving careful training from her man, Lou, when she realizes she has forgotten a crucial step. She forgot to lock the door, 
So while she was in the middle of the heist, another person walked in. The customer takes off, fearing that police could be on their way. Abby gathers whatever she can and bails. In her panic, she only gets away with about $13,000 worth of jewelry. A very low haul for a high stakes job. She was disappointed in herself and she wanted to prove that she could be better. I'm sure the Gilmore brothers and Lewis were disappointed they didn't get a big amount of jewelry, but at the same time, the way she handled herself, they knew that she could do these in the future. The band of thieves dust themselves off and head back to the drawing board to map out their next robbery. And this time, to avoid the heat from their last two jobs, they decide to get out of Georgia altogether and head down to Panama City, Florida. For Abby, this next Florida heist is critical. This initial failure of uh, forgetting to do something so basic as locking the door was something that she just couldn't live with. There was no way that she was going to allow this misstep to happen again. A few days later, on a warm August day in Panama City, she walks into a large jewelry store, determined to get it right. She locked the door, of course, and Lou and the Gilmore brothers are outside, heavily armed as usual. Abby shows her handgun, orders the two employees into the store's bathroom, and zip ties them. She walks back out to the front and then proceeds to commit the heist and taking all the jewelry. This time, Abby cleans the place out, and she's officially in the big leagues. She's able to quickly leave with approximately $700,000 in jewelry. Over the next six months, Abby, along with her main man, Lou, and the Gilmore brothers, expand their enterprise and take their act on the road. Four more stores in three different states. They continued to rob stores throughout the Southeast. They went to South Carolina, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Abby's confidence grows with every robbery she commits. And after each job, the Gilmores sell the loot and then give Abby and Lou their cut. They were very successful. They were able to steal almost $4 million worth of jewelry. After nearly 10 months of back-to-back -back heists, Abby and Lou take some time off to enjoy their growing fortune. But unbeknownst to them, while they are rolling in cash, law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, are now hot on their trail. They release surveillance video to the media. She's not covering her face. Her face is all over the news. Someone has to recognize this girl. And they know she's not working alone. She was wearing a earpiece. She definitely had somebody who was the lookout, getaway driver, who's in the area. The police were getting tips and calls from everywhere. They're able to identify the brash beauty as Abby Kemp, but the police still have yet to figure out just who she's working with. That is until their social media photos lead them to Lou Jones. Several people saw Lou and Abby wearing the jewelry and posting pictures on social media. Then, one day in early January, Abby and Lou receive unexpected visitors. Are you Abigail Kim? The police stormed into their apartment. So when Abby is actually captured, she does not resist, and they take her in. They are charged with several counts of conspiracy, robbery, and brandishing a firearm. After a few days of mounting pressure from law enforcement, Abby gives up the names of their accomplices, Michael and Larry Gilmore. The Gilmore brothers were arrested as well and charged with conspiracy to interfere with commerce by threats or violence. Facing serious time behind bars, Abby takes a deal. She admits to her involvement and pleads guilty to multiple charges, including conspiracy to interfere with commerce by robbery and brandishing of a firearm during a violent crime. As part of her deal, Abby is forced to betray her man and the brothers. At first, it wasn't something that she wanted to do because she would have to testify against Lou, who she loved. But she has no other options. And thanks to her testimony, all three men are found guilty of conspiring to commit a robbery that affected commerce and using firearms in connection with multiple robberies across the Southeast. And for her role, Abby is sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. I think Abby just started out doing this for love, to please her mentor, her man, 
and that romance grew into the thrill of the robberies, the thrill and the, you know, the drill and rush. She could have anyone that she wants, and she chose to be with Lou. And I think Abby was looking for a community, and she found that with Lou and the Gilmore brothers. Abby always wanted to break free from her privileged upbringing. She was a person who was from the right side of the tracks, but always wanted to be on the wrong side of the law. And she found a very exciting life of crime and ended up being as far from suburbia as one can be. Abby Kemp chose to trade in her wealthy suburban life for a new man and a life of